You're listening to C-Suite Success Radio with your host and executive coach, Sharon Smith. If corporate success is your goal, C-Suite Success Radio offers you informative interviews with experts that will help you shorten your learning curve and accelerate your momentum to higher achievement. C-Suite Success Radio makes it simple and easy for you to tap into the wisdom of other successful business people who know the path you're traveling. If you're ready for success in corporate America, welcome to your new home at C-Suite Success Radio. And now, time for your host and C-Suite Executive Coach, Sharon Smith. Welcome to this week's episode of C-Suite Success Radio. I am your host, Sharon Smith of C-Suite Results. Each week we focus on success, a word we all know and something we strive towards, but not a word that's easy to define. All of our topics and guests are aimed to help you achieve the goals you've set for your organization and for yourself as a leader, but more importantly, to help you accelerate the pace of your success. On today's show, we have Matt McGowan, president of Adestra, an enterprise marketing technology business where he oversees the global business and its more than 150 employees. Prior to Adestra, Matt was head of strategy at Google and YouTube, where he worked with Google leadership and the executive teams at the big six advertising holding companies. Matt has an MBA from the University of Oxford and a BA from Lafayette College, spends most of his time in New York City and Toronto. Let's listen to the conversation I had with Matt and learn how he defines success and the lessons he has learned to help you gain the edge you are looking for. And I want to welcome Matt McGowan to the call today. Matt, I'm so excited to have you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Sharon. It's good to be here. Yeah, I was really excited when we met last month, I think it was, or maybe the end of May in Dallas at the C-Suite Network conference and had some really great conversation. I've had some great conversations since, so I'm really excited to introduce you to our audience. And while they've heard a short description of you in the introduction, I'd love for them to hear from you. Who is Matt and what is Adestra? Perfect. So a little bit about me. I'm a born and bred New Yorker. I'm the oldest of three brothers. I joined Adestra. Well, let's start back this way. I learned about Adestra about 12 years ago when uh, my business at the time, a media business, was looking to consolidate what we called back then email service providers, which we might now call marketing automation platforms. Got to know the team a long time ago. And uh, Adestra specifically is focused on customer retention and loyalty. So Adestra is a, a platform that allows clients, which, are, which tend to be highly complex, uh, mid to large enterprise corporations, to better you know, communicate with their customers, getting that right message to the right person at the right time. We focus uh, primarily on email. We also power uh, SMS and in-app messaging. What differentiates Adestra from some of the other email and automation platforms out there? It's interesting. It's a great question. Uh, from the outside looking in, often they all kind of look the same. But there are some very specific products within our platform that differentiate us. Some of that is around ease of use. Some of that is around automation and delivery. Some of that is around customer support. Um, we're the only platform out there that actually has in-platform chat support. So if you are doing something, building automations or journeys, or just have a general question 24 hours a day, you can get a full-time Adestra employee, no matter where it is in the world you sit, to help you uh, solve those little problems before they become big problems. I think from a product point of view, those are, those are some, some strong differentiators. From a team point of view, which is really why I joined Adestra, I have never worked with such an amazing group of people. We are still a founder-led business. We have about 160 employees. Everyone's full-time. Everyone's gone through the training. Long story short, I uh, have had the pleasure of working in a few places in my career. I have never been surrounded by such, such a strong team before. So I would say that people uh, are the biggest differentiator. And that's something I talk about a lot with clients and with other folks or whomever I'm having the conversation with. It's the human capital. It's the people. That's the biggest asset and the biggest differentiator between most businesses and the ones that are the best of the best, I think, have everything to do with the people behind behind the scenes doing the work. I couldn't agree more. It's interesting. Uh, Duster's actually trademarked the term software 
and a service mm-hmm. versus software as a service. And it really goes to the heart of the business, which is that the software is there to help you uh, accomplish your tasks. It's there. It's strong. It does what it says it does. And we often find clients figure out ways and to do, th- to do things that we didn't even know we could do. So the product is the software is there, but it's the people. Uh, it's the person at the end of that, the other side of that chat box or the other side of the phone or the other side of the email. It's your account manager. It really, it really uh, makes a difference when you're working with people or, you know, vendors or technology providers, whatever it is. It really makes, it really makes a difference when you're working with people that you get along with, that you have confidence in and that you enjoy spending time with. And that you know we're going to deliver well for your customers because I have so many nightmare stories of picking up the phone. I think I even get anxiety every time I have to either start a chat box window or pick up the phone (laughs) to solve a problem because most of the time it seems that the person on the other end does nothing but apologizes and never actually fixes the problem, never calls back, never does what they say they're going to do, and then I end up having to call again. And when you have a company where the people are – the service and it's not just software as a service but and a service i love that you trademark that it makes all the difference not just for the people working there but for your customers i i couldn't agree more and it, at the end of the day our customer support team whether it's first line or second line doesn't get off the phone doesn't stop chatting with you until your problem solved so we don't wow. sign a ticket you get, you know, we don't assign you a number and say, we'll get back to you with the solution. We actually stay there with you while we're trying to figure out how to solve the problem, whatever that problem might be. That's a huge differentiator. Was the business already in that culture when you joined them? Because you've known about the company. I think you were a customer long before you were with them. Has it always been this way? Yeah, it really speaks to the testament of uh, Henry Hyder Smith and Steve Denner, the the two founders of the business. This was something that they built into the, you know, the daily workflow from day one. And it was just the two of them. Actually, it was four of them at the very beginning. But when it was just the four of them, they they would solve customers' problems immediately. They didn't have the luxury. And if you ask, actually, Henry Hyder Smith says it well. He goes, "We didn't have. We were bootstrap business." <laughs> We didn't have we didn't have the luxury to lose a client. <laughs> and that's not a bad place so, to be in in terms of building that kind of culture. It worked. Not at all. It worked, and it still works. It's a hard thing to sell. It's a very hard thing to sell because when you speak to again, when you're on the outside looking in, everyone says they have the support. That said, you know I think our customers are a testament to that ethos. And at the end of the day. We have about a 96, 97 percent customer retention rate over 10 years. That's huge. Um, and again, this is why I joined the business. So to your original question, you know, it was there when I got here, and it's something that I continue that I'll continue to support. I truly believe in. We will we will be there for our customers whenever they need us. And for any company out there or leader listening, if you're in an industry that is competitive and you have other companies that do the same thing, it is your people that are the differentiator. It's not always going to be that you have a better product or that you have the newest, flashiest, you know, whiz-bang technology. It really is the people behind the company and the people who talk about your company, the people who are out there every day saying whether they love or hate their job. And that's huge for a company and how they retain their employees. So that's awesome. I love to hear these kinds of stories about it and that Adestra is doing that. Well, I appreciate that. From the work perspective, what's the most fulfilling part about the work you do? As far as what I find fulfilling specifically what within the capacity of me running the Adestra business is that we focus on retention. We focus on loyalty. We are a platform that retailers or companies in the travel and hospitality space or media companies leverage to better communicate with their customers. I really enjoy that. I, 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 uh, I spent a long time in my career on the acquisition side of marketing, looking to acquire new customers. And, and there's a lot of tools out there and there's a lot of budgets against acquisition. But I find that the retention side and making sure that like you're putting the, your best foot forward, getting that right message to the right person at the right time and place is often overlooked. And I really enjoy evangelizing retention and loyalty. It's very fulfilling. And I think if you had to kind of ask, you know, what's one thing about our day-to-day that I really enjoy, it's, it's that 
you know, we're working on very complex, extremely important projects on behalf of our clients. And that's primarily because we are the tool that allows our clients to speak to their customers in an intelligent manner. And I really enjoy that. We're, we're, we're mission critical for and our clients, our clients' success. Um, it's mission critical that we, that we perform. And, and I like being that important. I like that piece. I like, I like being in that, in that, uh, in that specific spot. I like the way you look at that. I've never heard or talked to anyone in marketing or email automation or any similar field. I'm not trying to compare you to, you know, Mm -hmm. certain companies or anything like that. But I know a lot of folks in marketing and I've never heard anyone refer to their role as mission critical. And I put a, it put a big smile on my face when you did, because I could tell that you believe it because it's true and that it is important to you and that you really are fulfilled by that. So it was really neat to hear you put it that way. What What is a business at the end of the day, right? The business, its whole purpose is to serve its customers. And uh, when you become that platform that facilitates that relationship, you can't take it lightly. And it's very fulfilling. And the acquisition side of the world, interesting, and it's mission critical to propelling your stock price forward. We find is uh, customers and clients choose those companies that best represent their needs and best build, you know, and build the, and build the strongest relationships with them. And you know, it's nice to be a part of that. Yeah, you're helping your clients build the retention and loyalty of their customers. Mm-hmm. Which it's, exactly. That's really that's a really neat way to look at what you do, and I, I love it. That's really great. Talking about fulfillment, it's very closely related to the topic of the show in general, but success. A lot of times people are not fulfilled in the work they do because they may have gone after the wrong definition of success. Their parents said, you need to be a doctor, a lawyer, or whatever it might be, or my parents said, you need to go to college, and I didn't know what to do other than just go to business school because that was the only class I did well in a high school <laughs> like out of the entire four years <laughs> I did well in one class it was my last you know semester of last year in school I took a business class and said oh this is interesting okay but no one ever sat down with me and helped me define or asked the 17 year old well what does success look like for you what would you what really energizes you what gets you excited at the end of the day what is it that you know if you could do all day long and not even get paid for it would make you happy and instead I ended up getting an accounting degree because it made sense and then never really wanted to be an accountant by the time it was said and done and never fulfilled with that degree and the work I took from it and then I got a master's in something else that wasn't fulfilling because again I was going after the wrong drivers and mm-hmm. I think a great segue from the fact that what you do is so fulfilling how do you define success success for me is a lot to do with a steep learning curve so professionally I define success uh, being in environments where I am constantly challenging myself. Uh, I don't fear failure. Um, I actually embrace it. I feel most fulfilled when I am learning, failing fast, and growing my skill set. If you kind of, if you just take a step back away from work, success also has, for me anyway, has a lot to do with spending time with my family, my my wife. My son, our extended family, my uh, in-laws, my parents, my brothers, uh, my brother-in-law, so on and so forth. So, you know, like I feel most fulfilled and I am achieving success when I'm challenged professionally and have the time to spend time with family and friends. You know, when you said that you could ask that question a hundred times and get a hundred different answers, (laughs) it's actually the point. Or one of the points of the show is that everyone I ask this question to, which is everyone that comes on the show, has a different answer. And the whole reason I like that and the whole point of that is because when we don't have our own definition, we often end up being unfulfilled, as I was alluding to with my story. I, I went through my gosh, probably close to 20 years of being unfulfilled because of someone else's definition of success. You have to go to college and get a good job or whatever that looks like. Um, So-and-so's kids are doing this and -and so-and-so's kids are doing that. And you feel like, you know, as a peer to those children, your parents are making you feel like you have to be a certain way. And that doesn't actually equal fulfillment. So I love the fact that a hundred times you could ask that question and get a hundred different answers and that the definition changes over time because the definition of success for a 20 year old should not be the same as a 30 year old or 40, you know, I mean, life changes. So of course our definition has to change. So I'm glad that you mentioned both of those. Cause I think those are very key points. I would add to it. You know, I went to school to be an engineer 
because I was told at a young age I was good with numbers. Somewhere around, just like you said, your last class of your second semester, your senior year, <laughs> uh, somewhere around my junior year, I decided that while I might be good at this, it, I don't feel very good about it. <laughs> it wasn't fulfilling the needs that I had in that moment. I may, I may have had a fantastic career if I had gone down that path. I may not have. I'm not sure. But I wasn't afraid at that time to make a change. And I think part of success is feeling like you're in control. And I think throughout my career, when, when I found myself feeling almost out of control, those were the moments where I know I was the farthest from success. So bringing myself back to to a place where I felt like I knew what I was doing and I had understanding of, uh, of my environment was very important. And again, it's in those moments and coming out of those moments where you learn the most about yourself. Absolutely. And I think it's coming out of those moments where I feel the most successful. <laughs> you, you shared with me when you provided your bio information that in 2013 you were named the DMA and Marketing Edge Rising Star. And how mm -hmm. did your definition of success play into reaching that accomplishment? Well, that was an interesting one. That was, uh, that was a shock to me. I didn't think I was doing anything all that special at the time. I guess I was very much in my own head doing what I enjoyed, which was driving the marketing arm of a large media business. And I hadn't realized other people were taking notice. It's funny, like I went into that feeling extremely proud. Um, I had my brother actually attend the ceremony with me and I got a little award and all that. But coming out and in the month, even years after that, I found that my definition of success changed mostly because the marketing edge and the DMA started incorporating me into their, on the other side of what they do, and that is like the education side. And I started feeling much more fulfilled imparting my knowledge and, and experience on others than I ever knew I could. Coming out of that, like the learning that like I had something I could share and that there were people out there who were interested in hearing about my experiences was very fulfilling. It's interesting because we never know what, a situation or a thing will provide for us, right? If we're especially, I should say, if we're not open to or looking for opportunities, but where I'm going with this is the reason you got the award was because you were focused and fulfilled on the work you were doing and you weren't paying attention or concerned about what other people were thinking of you or what your impact was on others outside of ensuring that you were probably doing the best job you could and you were fulfilled doing mm -hmm. it, that got you the recognition, even though you weren't looking for it, that you got. And from that, you got even a, be a bigger reward because you learned that you like this education side that you may not have known about if you hadn't won the award. So I find the whole thing very fascinating. I think that's the most interesting thing of life is like you have to, if you're in control of your situation as best as you can be, there are all sorts of surprises uh, that can, that you can learn from. And uh, that was just one of them. The, the, the teaching side is, is super interesting. And I've done a few classes and a few things here and there that I find uh, to be some of the most fulfilling work I've ever done. And I'm going to turn the tables on the last question about how success played into that and ask you more about struggles or obstacles that you've had along the way in your career, the biggest ones or one that you really had to get over or come around and what you learned from that. Obstacles are learning moments. I would argue you want to be encountering obstacles throughout your career. You don't want to bump into surmountable obstacles every day. Throughout my career, uh, I used to be kind of afraid of obstacles. And then at some point in my career, I thought maybe it's best to like ignore obstacles or not share the obstacles you encounter. But today, I look at obstacles you know, very differently. And it's actually with my team, it's one of the things we we have a, a ups and a downs process that we review every week and everyone on the team uh, partakes in it and it's a public document that is shared throughout the business so anyone can look at anyone else's comments or uh, or notes and part of that ups and downs is to share the downs share the obstacles so we can all learn from them what are some of the biggest obstacles i can think of a ton of them and I don't know which one might have been the biggest what they have taught me is that first foremost I can't do everything and no one can you need a team 
and it's nice if your team brings different skill sets to the table. You must achieve a balance in life. Uh, you can't do any one thing all the time. Those who work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, often burn out quick. Those who ignore the office often fail fast. I, I think, if anything, you know, obstacles, definite learning experiences. And now that I've kind of spoken this and thought it through a little bit, the biggest obstacle I've probably ever encountered was not in the office. I tore all the in my right knee uh, while in college. And we had spoken about going from an engineer into what I ended up graduating with, which was a, a degree in business and economics and a minor in government and law. The moment I made that switch was in a ice hockey game where I basically did. I completely tore all three, all four ligaments in my right knee, and I wasn't able to walk for about six months. Oof. So coming out of that, first of all, keeping school up, obviously I wasn't on the ice anymore, um, but learning that I wasn't indestructible, uh, I wasn't going to go on and play professional, but that this was a moment where I had a choice where I could kind of like throw the towel in or rise above it and start doing the things I really wanted to do in life was, was critical. And I made a lot of changes in those six months that I may not have made if I wasn't laying in bed <laughs> with my leg up over my heart um, <laughs> for, for, for that extended period of time. You know, I often, it's funny, I didn't think of it immediately, but I often reflect back at that time because it's about halfway through my life. I am now, I've now had a, basically a, a fake knee <laughs> or a bionic <laughs> knee long, longer than I had a real knee. It's interesting, but the, I, can, I, can bring, I could probably bring it all back to that moment where I decided that I wasn't going to follow in possibly what were others' dreams about playing hockey professionally. I wasn't going to follow in others' dreams about becoming an engineer. And it was time to make decisions for me because when I graduated college, I was going to be on my own. Right. <laughs> and I needed to live my life, not someone else's. That's great because you had kind of two choices in that situation. One is to feel sorry for yourself and wallow and not make any changes. And the other is the direction you went was to use that time and figure out what you were going to do next and learn from it and realize that obstacles can be overcome. And, you know, interestingly enough, it doesn't happen overnight. So it no. took a while no. to make those decisions. I, I And I've made other, I found other obstacles along the way. I originally, you know, I left college. I joined a uh, capital markets and trading program on Wall Street, which was super selective and very hard to get into, and which I hated immensely. <laughs> <laughs> um, I found myself not looking forward to Monday mornings, not looking forward to Tuesday mornings, uh, <laughs> Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday morning. Yeah. And when you're very unhappy in, the, in what it is you do that, you know, exudes in other parts of your life, you pick up bad habits and such. So um, I made another big change, you know, two and a half years out of school, gave up Wall Street. So it's a 50%, or actually it was like a 55% pay cut in that process. Not an easy thing to do when you're 22, but um, I, something I decided I had to do. I, it's, there's lots of obstacles in life. Some of them are uh, in your head. Some of them are in the office. Some of them are with people that you're working with. Some of them are in the products that you're developing or supporting or evangelizing. I think the the only thing I can say is go in with an open mind, expect that they're going to be there, and try and fully understand the situation before you start to make decisions. And that. don't be afraid to make the hard decisions. <laughs> That's really great because, of course, I was going to ask you what – what lessons you've learned or what advice you would give the next generation a leader, but you just gave us such profound advice without me even asking that I don't have to ask the question now. That means anyone... Well, I got some more. I got a couple more things I would actually share. Then, um, oh, please do. <laughs> that's okay. Absolutely. Um, please do. Um, I'll keep them short, but one one is uh, patience. I wish I had more patience. As I get older, I learn to be more patient, but in a world in which we're all looking at the next quarter and we're in Wall Street's very focused on quarterly results, those who succeeded in whatever it is they've done have been patient. And I can't 
stress that enough. Patience is key. Second, this is a bit shorter. Tell the truth. Um, it's okay to make mistakes. I, I always argue that you don't have to remember anything if you always tell the truth. It gets complicated when you start bending the truth. We all make mistakes. We all do things that we may regret in the future. I find that being honest and being patient are too often, two traits that are hard to uh, embrace, but they are super vital. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought them up, and I often get lost in listening to the guest on the show because you're providing such great advice and such great wisdom and things that anybody, including myself, can say, yeah, I need to implement more of that. I could use a little more patience. I could, you know, the telling the truth part, I'm a little overly, not overly truthful. If you, I don't know if you can be, I'm a little blunt at times. I'm not much of a, I'm not known for sugarcoating things. And sometimes I do say things that might be a little too honest in my approach. That one I I don't have to work on so much as maybe learning how to and when it's appropriate to speak to people that way. (laughs) I get it. I get it. No, I think that makes a lot of sense. And and by the way, that that brings up another, and I think you've done this very well, but that brings up more advice and, you know, listening to a person so that the person you're listening to feels like they are being understood is another pillar of uh, success. You know, we all hold the old adage, you have two ears and one mouth, but it's not just about listening. It's about listening so that the person you're listening to feels like they're being understood. You don't have to agree, and I'm not going to necessarily agree with you. I don't think you can ever be too honest. Um, but, um, <laughs> Good. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> but, but, but picking that up and making sure that you're listening is so vital. It's, there's, I mean, I guess you could write a book on like the uh, best pieces of advice you've ever been given. I'm sure there's a ton of them out there, but um, those are the, those are probably three very vital things I've picked up over time. I can't really say any one person taught me to be patient. I wish, I, mean, I know, I know my parents tried when I was a child, but <laughs> um, I, like, I can't really bestow that on any one person. It's something that's just kind of, you know, I've, I've learned over time. Yes. And I, I often remind people patience is vital. Absolutely. Some things we learn from others and some things we learn just through living and trial and error and potential failure. Even though I don't like the word failure, it's only a failure if you keep <laughs> doing the same damn thing over and over again and expect different uh, results. So that's insanity, I guess. I definitely wasn't taught patience at home because I had some impatient people in my home. <laughs> and I'm, yeah, patience. I, I meditate not as often as I would like to or intend to. I intend to daily and haven't for a while. It does help quiet the mind. But this is great. I really appreciate you bringing up patience. Listening is one. People, yeah, anyone listen. Any Anyone listening to the show today and that has been listening for a little while now has heard the theme of listening before because it's so true. Anyone successful, the people I have on the show, are going to tell you that listening is important because they understand the value of listening because you you folks that are my guests on, on the call are people who understand what it takes to be successful. And listening is huge. And like you said, listening to hear and listening to understand, not just listening to have your point or your argument and your counterpoint right not that kind of listening not but listening for <laughs> yeah, listening for understanding okay last question and it's time for me to let you go with all this advice you've been giving us and you've mentioned some other things that you've learned along the way what's your favorite book when it comes to either leadership or personal development or something that has helped you along the way I've read more books than I can remember my favorite thing to do now by the way and I highly recommend everyone get involved is uh, listen to books. Mm -hmm. I queue things up on Audible. That's my platform of choice, but whatever platform uh, you decide to use, I find that there is no end to those like 20 minute, 30 minute periods of time where I can work my way through through another book. I also found that I can speed up the, uh, yes. I, so I started out at one time. Now I'm at like one, 1. 1.75. And it means I can listen to the whole New York Times, for instance, uh, on Audible in about 20 minutes. So you're, um, you're not a am speed... I retaining it all? No. <laughs> so you're, you're not a speed reader, you're a speed listener. <laughs> yeah, I tried the speed reading, reading thing over and over again. You remember all those courses yes. and uh, all these tricks? Keep a Google <laughs> underline, use your fingers. Never worked for me. But the listening thing really did. So I guess I'll be a little non-traditional here with the answer to this question and um my favorite book 
um, I read a long time ago. I think they uh, very much. They, if there's a if there's a trend here, it's probably. And I've read them again. I read them actually probably every few years. But they remind me to continue to be adventurous and ask questions. And they remind me that stepping off the kind of the beaten path is always a good thing. Kind of going to the to the blue space or whatever. But I'm a big fan of uh, Beyond the Wall by Everett Abbey. I'm a big fan of On the Road by Jack Kerouac. Um, big fan of the beach from my perspective. They're just about people who decided to follow their own path and do things that made them happy. And uh, that is quality that I've always kind of cherished. can't say I've been as adventurous as, as those authors, but I've strived, I think, to understand why they were so adventurous and to be as adventurous as I could possibly be in the, you know, the construct that I live. Those are some of my favorite books. If you want to get more into like the business book uh, and leadership books, my favorite author is a brother duo, Brian and uh, Jeffrey uh, Eisenberg. They have uh, a new book out, which I'm a big fan of, around uh, Amazon, which I recommend okay. uh, everyone read. It's be like Am- be like it's called be like Amazon. Even a lemonade stand can do it. It's a very interesting dialogue between. Uh, an older gentleman and a younger gentleman um, who are in a car and they're and they're kind of talking about life lessons. And uh, anyway, I read it. I read it on a flight. I read it in about four and a half hours, I think, on a flight from New York to LA. But uh, I, I'm a big fan. And there, there are other books that are, are equally as fantastic. Um, one of my favorites was uh, Waiting for Your Cat to Bark. Oh, gosh. Um, but um, anyway, I'll leave it at that. But, I love uh, it. Yeah, I, I'm, I love reading. I'm a big reader. And uh, I think, though, I do think that making sure you're not only reading kind of like professional help or leadership type books is important. There's lessons in, in fiction and nonfiction alike. That's great. I appreciate all of that. That's a lot of. I started scribbling down some of them and realized I'll just go back and listen to the recording later and get all of them. But I definitely wrote down "Be Like Amazon." Thank you so much for your insights and for joining us today. I know you're extremely busy in your role, and I really appreciate you joining us on the call. Thank you, Sharon. I really enjoyed it. It's fantastic. Wonderful. Have a great day. We'll talk soon. Thanks for listening today. Tune in for our next episode. And in the meantime, you can get more resources at www.c-suiteresults.com. Make it a successful day.